1871, Charles Darwin recognized that ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. In 1933, Bertrand Russell noticed the same thing when he said that the fundamental cause of the trouble in the modern world today is that the stupid are cocksure while the intelligent are full of doubt. Today, this unabashed arrogance of ignorance is known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. It's a phenomenon where the more someone knows about a given subject after years of concentrated academic instruction and vocation, the more they realize they still don't know and the lower they tend to rate their confidence in that subject. Conversely, the dumber they are, the smarter they think they are, even if they've never done any actual study at all. Then if they've seen propaganda on Fox News or Answers in Genesis Ministries, they will be convinced that they already know better than all the world's best educated expert specialists anywhere ever, even about topics they can't pronounce, much less define. This leaves them in a position where they can't make valid argument on their own because they don't really know what they're saying. So instead, they quote what others have said, which they think supports their position of prejudice, because prejudice is all they have. We're about to see another demonstration of that. This is the third and final episode in our series on creationist quote mining. So what about these ideas of phylogenetics, the go-to sto story of evolutionists, that genetic similarities between creatures is proof of common design? No, they're not really creatures since they were never created, and the genetic similarities are proof of common ancestry. No designer is even possible. But what you never hear about are the countless incongruencies that ruin that idea for evolutionists. It's a fancy story, but it's just not true. Now, now, we're not talking about Genesis today. We're not talking about any story at all. Now, we do hear about incongruencies sometimes. I pointed out a few in my videos, but there aren't any that ruin the idea of evolution. Never was, not even one. This science paper discusses the difference in digits between dinosaurs, which from which birds allegedly evolved, and birds themselves provides a nasty genetic conundrum for evolution theory. Of course, this isn't the problem you think it is, and there are solutions, including this one regarding a frame shift mutation that would take care of that rather nicely. I should add that I made a 10-part video series proving that birds are definitely dinosaurs. At that time, I was rebutting David Minton from the pseudoscience propaganda mill known as Answers in Genesis. He was trying to deny that evolutionary relationship, and this very point came up. Here's how that went down. It has a long tail. There's no weight to it. And look where the legs go and attach, right here. This would never balance if it didn't walk from its knees. So uh, here you can see the feathers in the wing. I had our artist draw... Uh, this uh, so-called dromaeosaur, which is generally considered a dinosaur, as a bird, and that would balance, and this certainly looks like a sensacrum up in this area here, that would balance, but if you tried to stand it up so it walked like a dinosaur, bringing the balance point to the hip, it would fall on its nose. So I conclude that dromaeosaurs are birds. <laughs> And that would include Velociraptors, Deinonychus, and Microraptors. Hold on now. Back in 2008, when you still thought you could deny all of the feathered dinosaurs except for Archaeopteryx, back when you didn't know that Deinonychus had feathers too, you said then that Deinonychus was clearly a theropod dinosaur. What changed? You said that it couldn't possibly be related to birds because you called it a lizard-hipped, cold-blooded reptile with what you thought was a completely different respiratory system. You didn't know that each of the traits that you thought were uniquely avian applied to every other tetanurin as well as some other types of dinosaurs too. You said then that the fingers of Deinonychus couldn't correlate with the fingers of birds, although that same study also indicates that Archaeopteryx fingers didn't correlate with birds either, yet you're happy to accept Archaeopteryx as a bird, even though it has a lot more in common with other Silurosaurs than it ever had with any bird that ever lived. So tell me, by what hypocrisy did you contradict your former self to overturn and reverse all your own previous exclusions? So when a dinosaur has feathers, it is a bird. Wait. What? So when a dinosaur has feathers, it is a bird. So when a dinosaur has feathers, it is a bird. This paper describes teleost fish and says that their genetic incongruencies between the phylogenetics of different species of fish is a problem for evolution. 
No, this only proves that that quote miner never bothered to read the paper he cited because it doesn't say that at all. Where did it say anything in the notes that he put on the slides beside it? It looks like he's quoting the paper, but that paper doesn't say any of that, nor is it even implied. This paper says incongruencies across different data sets is not a novel observation within phylogenetic analysis. Not surprisingly, we found incongruencies between the phylogenetic signals of the genes and morphological characters, and this is across the board for all life kinds. Here's how to be an internet paladin for creationism. Go to a religious extremist pseudoscience propaganda site, copy their mind quotations, and do not read the source material. Because if you actually read the papers, you will invariably find out that they don't really say or even imply what you think they did. For example, the paper he just cited is talking about Arenaceidae, the taxonomic family of hedgehogs, both the spiny hedgehog and the hairy hedgehog, which is the same thing, but softer. Every creationist would agree that these are the same kind, meaning that God created one original pair of hedgehogs, that there was only one pair of them on Noah's Ark, and that one of their daughter groups simply grew thicker sheaths of keratin on their hair, which is what the quills are made of. They're just slightly modified fur. So this quote miner is arguing against his own belief. What he has stumbled on is the simple fact that tracing genetic orthologs isn't as easy as it sounds. It's actually quite a complicated process because of the many types of mutations occurring in different parts of the genome in different times, and different species. And we see the same thing when we're tracing genetic markers of human migration. And we have the same problem when tracing the phylogeny of domestic dogs, which we already know are related through evolutionary processes that we've been using since the dawn of agriculture, and that we have derived these, be these breeds by uh, selective breeding. Because in many cases, we have historical records to prove that we did. So the incongruencies only mean that at this moment, we're missing some piece of the jigsaw puzzle and that we will figure this out too, just like we always do. So an evolutionist tell you that genetic similarities between one kind of living thing and another is verification that they're related. They're not telling you the whole story. Let me help with an important detail. There's no such thing as a kind. Creationists can't define kinds. They have no means to identify kinds, and there's no way to distinguish which kind various species should belong to. But we do have evolutionary clades, and they're very similar in that when the Bible says, let the earth bring forth all the plants and animals and such after their own kind, that's a fair assessment of how evolution works. At no point in evolutionary history, does one kind of thing ever turn into or give birth to another fundamentally different kind of thing? Evolution is summarily defined as descent with inherent genetic modification. And the law of monophyly holds that every new genus or species that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were. There is similarities in between all the kinds of life as necessary because they live in similar environments. No, that's nonsense. That assumes that whales and manatees should have similar DNA because they're both marine mammals. Of course, their respective genomes rather exactly match their fossil history, where serinians are modified atherotheres, like elephants, and cetaceans are modified artiotactyls, more closely related to hippopotamus. But the incongruencies are numerous and countless, and they don't talk about them because they kill the idea of phylogenetics. Yeah. I've talked about incongruencies and how they are resolved in my video on the phylogeny challenge, which is a death knell for creationism, by the way, because it shows how phylogenies work and how the fanciful notions of created kinds don't work and can't even pretend to. Here's another. Little confidence can be placed in phylogenies generated solely from higher primate cr uh, 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 craniodental evidence. So even for mankind, it's the same. It's interesting that this quote miner includes all higher primates, like gorillas and chimpanzees, in the category of mankind. Otherwise, seriously? This complaint is so dumb. Yeah, you shouldn't base your phylogeny solely on one part of the physiognomy because there are extenuating circumstances, like the fact that evolution is not always linear and, it, and it's not being guided in one direction. It's about biodiversity, and it's blind leading to several different lineages at once. So the systematists should base their phylogenies on a suite of often complex and intricate morphological and molecular traits. Uh, another one provides problems for evolution and in, uh, incongruencies with the idea of phylogenetics. No, what this quote miner is doing is lying. He's not quoting the study. 
All of the notes written on the side of the slide are not quotes, they're lies based on his own misunderstanding and prejudice against understanding. This paper is actually strongly supporting evolution and does not even imply what he wants to pretend that it does. If you have to lie to defend your truth, then it was never truth to begin with. I could list dozens and dozens of these. I'm just showing you some of the better ones. <laughs> Remember that not one of these has supported his point at all, yet he thinks these are the better ones? If this is the best you can do, why keep trying? You can't do better than your best, so when your best isn't good enough, it's time to quit and do something else until you can find something you can do. Understanding phylogenetic incongruence, lessons from phylostomid bats. Another one. Every kind of living thing they discover, they study, genetically, they find problems for the idea of phylogenetics. The idea that the genetic similarities found in one kind of life is evidence that they're related to another kind of life, that one type of organism is related to another through some evolutionary history. The more they study the, with genetics, which is increasing, ever increasing, the more incongruencies with that idea are discovered. Actually, all that that paper admits is that tracing phylogenetic orthologs is a difficult and exacting task, that it must be done carefully, methodically, meticulously, even when you're dealing with only one taxonomic family, in this case, bats. Now, creationists often say that all bats are the same kind, that Noah had only two bats on the ark, and that after the flood, those two diversified into the 1,400 species of bats we have today so that Noah wouldn't have to have thousands of bats on his ark, along with thousands of every other family of animals too. So creationists have to accept evolution even to justify their own mythology. So if we find a fossil bat, which is not the same species as any bat we have today, the fundies will still assist that, that it's the same thing, that it never changed, and is somehow proof against evolution. But we're not talking about all bats right now. We're only talking about one subset of them, specifically, Phylostomids being the leaf nodes bats. Now, creation is going to change their story to say that there were dozens of different kinds of bats and that there were at least several hundred bats on Noah's Ark, including multiple pairs just for the different kinds of leaf nodes bats. No, obviously not. That would be ridiculous even for someone as irrational as a creationist. They all believe that leaf nose bats are the same kind and that the genome should reveal that their, their, their biological relationship. So again, this quote miner is arguing against his own belief. He doesn't know that because he has little or no reading comprehension and absolutely no idea what he's talking about. So the story is crumbling. It was a fun story in the 1980s that genetic similarities between different kinds of life is evidence that they common, have common ancestry. But that idea has been shot to pieces by modern genetics, which endlessly finds incongruencies with this idea, which evolutionists are either ignorant of or don't talk about. So, so let's talk about the idea of there being incongruencies when we look at genetics. And I'm going to give you an example of a really fam famous incongruity. Um, whales and dolphins, cetaceans, swimming mammals, first appear in the fossil record about 55 million years ago. Um, and since that time, uh, due to paleontologists, we have a very good fossil record of the evolution of whales. Now, one of the things that was an initial puzzle is which land-dwelling mammal or group of mammals, which terrestrial mammals, actually gave rise uh, to those first whales. And for quite a while, um, uh, paleontologists thought, due to structural similarities, in the jaw, the middle ear, and other places, that it would be an extinct group of uh, land-dwelling carnivores known as mesonicates, or sometimes pronounced mesonicates. Uh, there were, was another group of paleontologists who thought, no, no, no. Um, there is another group um, known as artiodactyls that might be their actual antecedents. So there was a conflict. Now, it turns out that when molecular biologists went to town, uh, and started to look for molecular similarities, what they discovered is that there were profound genomic similarities between uh, cetaceans, swimming mammals, and uh, today's living artiodactyls. So that meant the molecular evidence was very strong on one side, and the fossil evidence many paleontologists 
argued, went for another group of living ancestors. That's the kind of incongruity that some critics of evolution would point out as a problem for evolution. But I'm sorry, to a researcher, an incongruity is not a problem, it's an opportunity. And it's an opportunity to do more and better science. So it turns out that there's a characteristic bone in the ankle of artiodactyls that are really not found in any other group of mammals. A lot of the early whale fossils were mostly skull, jawbone, part of the backbone. Very few of them had the leg bones, in other words, the ankles. And yes, the ancestors of whales did, in fact, have leg bones and had ankles. And lo and behold, about 15 years ago, a group of fossils was discovered that were much more complete. And they did have the leg bones right down to the toes. And lo and behold, they had the characteristic structure in the ankle region of an artiodactyl. So what that meant was that incongruity promoted more research. It allowed molecular phylogeny to match the fossil phylogeny, and it opened up an area of science that sort of helped to close the story. So the notion that anytime there's a disagreement between two ways of looking at something, it's fatal to the theory of evolution is absolute nonsense. What it does is to say, we don't have a complete story. So let's look deeper. Let's dig deeper. Let's look harder at what we have. And lo and behold, in this case, the incongruity resolved very much in favor of evolution. Now, here's another one. Mitochondrial DNA markers, another problem for evolutionist phylogenetics. Uh, mitochondria, uh, mitochondrial DNA markers are not a problem for evolution. They're a confirmation of it. Uh, one of the interesting things uh, about the little genome in mitochondria, in, in we humans, for example, our mitochondrial DNA is only about 17,560 base pairs, which is really small. But because mitochondria don't reproduce sexually, in other words, they don't undergo genetic recombination, it means that there are hyper variable regions in mitochondrial DNA. Because if you have a mutation there, it never gets corrected by genetic recombination. So what that means is mitochondria are very useful markers to trace evolution. And the other thing that's sort of cool about mitochondrial DNA is in animals, uh, the inheritance of mitochondrial DNA comes only from the mother. Uh, you and I got uh, 23 chromosomes from dad and we got 23 from mom, but we got all of our mitochondria from the cytoplasm of mom's egg cell. So our mitochondrial DNA comes from our mother. And what that means is we have a maternal line that goes on generation after generation after generation. And the rate of variability in that mitochondrial line is much higher than it is in the nuclear line. So this enables us to take groups of related organisms that haven't changed that much in an evolutionary sense, but because mitochondrial DNA, certain regions of it have a very high mutation rate, we can study uh, species separation, ancestry. We can even study the migration of groups of organisms around the world by studying mitochondrial DNA. It certainly doesn't represent a problem for evolution. It's one of the main tools by which we use evolution to trace species origin, origin migration, and interrelationships. Here's another. Genes, the different species, orphan genes, they're found everywhere in different things. These are genes that can't be found in one kind of life that are related, allegedly, to another kind. You study the one, you find these genes, you study the other creature it's supposedly closely related to, and it doesn't have them. But it ought to. Here's another one. 80% of proteins between humans and chimpanzees are different by at least one amino acid, often several. The idea of protein evolution is impossible. So let's start with the idea that protein evolution is impossible. And one of the, uh, one of the arguments I just heard is that 80% of the proteins between humans and chimpanzees differ by at least one amino acid. Um, that might be true between two unrelated human beings as well, because a difference of a single amino acid in many respects is trivial. Um, you, uh, you, you find these very, very small but insignificant differences uh, even within individuals in the same species. So it's not terribly surprising um, that we find, you know, single individual changes between us and a species um, 
with whom we shared a common ancestor uh, no more recent than about five or six million years ago. Uh, so the notion that we have these changes, that's a function of evolution. That's not a problem for it. Uh, but more important than that, the, uh, the, the, the notion that evolutionary biologists are stumped because they have found genes that one individual species possesses that are not possessed by a closely related species is a problem for evolution, overlook something. And that is increasingly, as we have found these genes, um, which are now called orphan genes, because we find them only in one species and not in that species relevant uh, relatives, um, that turns out to be evidence of the de novo origin of new genes. And the species, or the, I should say the genus, in which these orphan genes have been best studied is Drosophila, the fruit fly, uh, which is ubiquitous throughout the globe and is very widely used for studies of genetics and molecular biology. And a number of investigations have shown that there are as many as three or 400 orphan genes in various species of Drosophila, and they're there not because they're contradictory to the evolutionary record of these organisms, but rather because they represent the ease with which evolution can produce brand new genes by activating promoter regions in what used to be silent DNA, uh, by gene duplication, by uh, errors during DNA replication, and a whole variety of other mechanisms. So these orphan genes actually solve a problem that the critics of evolution often cite, which is where do new genes come from? Lo and behold, when we look at orphan genes, we see new genes coming into existence right under our eyes. So far from representing a problem, they actually are telling us how evolution works to produce new and novel and sometimes useful genetic information. And to add to that, you can have two related species where one has a new gene and one is maybe missing an ancestral or, or the gene that would be present at its sister, correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Here's another one. Staple, this one's really funny. I laugh at this. Staples of the middle ear. The creatures going upwards with red arrow are allegedly ancestors of one to the other. At the bottom, you have the oldest creature, the one above it, then above it, then above it. Each one of these is allegedly a transitional form to the next one. Now look at the stapes in the ear. They have they have these uh, parts, these limbs that come off of them. They're called cura, okay? And some have one in one kind of life and some in another. And we're allegedly going from the bottom creature that evolved through steps to the one at the top. Let's look at this incongruency. The one at the bottom has dual, dual cura in the stapes of the ear. The next one has only one. The next one has two again. The next one has two. The next one going up, just one. The next one going up, just one, and the next one has two again. You see, what sense does it make to believe that these creatures show an evolutionary transition from one to the other going upward through the geologic column, and yet the stapes in the ears bounce around from two, two cura to one, two to one, two to one, two to one? Is there any common sense to this? Of course not. It demonstrates different designs. If evolution were true, then we see a transition from one state to two. And that's all you'd see. Not from two to one to two to one. This demonstrates these creatures were not related. They're separately designed. This kills evolution theory. This discussion of the stapes, not the stapes, the stapes, which is a bone in the middle ear, uh, betrays an extraordinary misunderstanding of the use of cladistics in classification and evolutionary biology. Um, the, the, the person making this claim took a cladogram, which is designed to show the interrelationships between living species, turned the cladogram on its side, and then took a group of contemporary species and pretended that one was the ancestor of the next one, ancestor of the next one, and ancestor of the next one. In fact, all those species are alive today. And what the cladogram actually shows are the presence or the absence of shared, derived characteristics in organisms that live today. And in this particular case, what the cladogram shows is that the bifurcation of the stapes to form a cura, which is that sort of hole in the center, uh, has occurred multiple times in organisms on different, line of, different lines of descent. And that's the point that was made by the cladogram. Now, if 
the structure of that one little bone in the middle ear was regarded as the only evidence that mattered in terms of the interrelationships of these living groups of marsupials, you had to be a problem for evolution. But the fact of the matter is that cladogram is constructed by a wealth of other kinds of evidence, including overall morphology, the structure of the jaw, and above all, molecular relationships between species. So what it shows is the changes in the structure of this bone can occur independently with very little functional significance, and therefore they don't, again, don't present a problem for evolution. But again, I, I'm just amazed that anyone would take a cladogram that shows only contemporary organisms at the top, turn it on its side, and pretend that it represents changes through the fossil record, which it manifestly does not. Changes to allele frequency in populations which results in genetic drift is another alleged mechanism for evolution. I have sources if you doubt what I've got on the screen here, but this is a, these are simply observed facts established by science. Changing allele frequencies in populations creates increased heterozygosity, commonality in a population of some alleles while reducing heterozygosity of others over time. Instead of introducing new features, it causes existing traits to be either become lost or increasingly common, which is not a mechanism for evolutionary change because there's no new information created. What you're observing when you see allele frequencies in a population change over time is natural selection, or as Darwin would have put it, the preservation of favored traits. This is the mechanism of natural selection. Now, it's absolutely true that changes in allele frequencies do not explain where those alleles come from in the first place. There's a wonderful quip uh, that uh, one of my friends who's a developmental biologist likes to repeat, uh, which is that natural selection explains the survival of the fittest, but not the arrival of the fittest. Uh, and that's absolutely true. So changes in allele frequencies don't produce evolutionary novelty. That's what mutation does. That's what horizontal gene transfer does. Uh, that's what gene duplication does and a host of other mechanisms. Darwin understood very well. He didn't know the gene. He didn't know the word allele. Darwin understood very well, however, that natural selection could, in fact, select for certain characteristics in a population. That is what is reflected by changes in allele frequencies. Where do these novel alleles come from? That's something that Darwin wasn't sure of, although he was certain that variation did crop up. Today, with biochemistry, with modern genetics, and with molecular biology, we understand very well the mechanisms that generate these new alleles, which then drive changes in allele frequencies. So once again, evolution is confirmed, but not by looking just at changes in allele frequencies, that's natural selection, but by looking at the entire mechanism. And when we understand that, we can see dramatic changes in allele frequencies as reflecting evolution by natural selection in action. An organism either gets more like itself or it loses things, but it doesn't move towards becoming something else. Changing allele frequencies in populations is not a mechanism for evolutionary change. Changing allele frequencies continuously results in certain genes becoming recessive and no longer expressed in a given population, which constitutes a loss of genetic information. That's the opposite of evolution. Changes in allele frequencies <laughs> don't make genes recessive. <laughs> Oh. Evolution requires a continuous input of new genetic information because the fish can't have had all the genetic information for the stinger in the tail of a scorpion, the, spi the, the spines of, the, of, a, of, a, of a, a porcupine, and the eyeball of a human being, etc. That information couldn't have all been in the fish's genome. You got to get new genetic information to produce all these thousands and thousands of anatomical features in all these living things if evolution is true. But changes to allele frequency just get genes turned off. That's a loss of genetic information. Everything in the world is becoming more itself or going extinct because of this process. Well, one of the things that I have heard over and over again from critics of evolution is the mechanism of evolution, in particular natural selection, is only a mechanism of weeding faulty information out. So all that natural selection does is get rid of stuff. It doesn't produce any new stuff. Well, it turns out 
That's simply not true. Uh, and again, we do understand the mechanisms that produce novel genes with new capabilities and produce new proteins that can be used for a whole variety of purposes. And, and I'll give you one quick example. Uh, my friend Richard Lenski, uh, for many, many years, has carried out a long-term evolution experiment. It started in 1988. And what he has done is to culture the common bacterium Escherichia coli, E. coli, for generation after generation after generation. Um, simply looking for any genetic changes that might accumulate due to, due to evolutionary processes. Well, one of the interesting things about E. coli, and any microbiologist will tell you this right away, is E. coli cannot use citrate, citric acid, as a food source. Um, and that's the very definition. If your bacterium, if your unknown bacterium can grow on a Petri dish where citrate is the only food source, it ain't E. coli. Now, one of the things that, 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 uh, that, that Richard discovered was that after many, many generations, one of his cultures suddenly evolved the ability to grow on citrate. This was completely unexpected. But all of a sudden, when this culture of bacteria evolved, and that's the right word, the ability to grow on citrate, it grew more quickly than the other cultures. The cells became larger. In effect, they were fitter exactly in the language of Charles Darwin. Now, it took a few years to completely analyze the genetic changes that had occurred, but here's what happened. There is a group of genes that are operated together. We call those an operon. Um, the promoter for that operon, which contained uh, a gene for a protein that would allow citrate to get into the cell, that promoter was blocked in the presence of oxygen. So if the bacteria was growing in an aerobic environment, ordinary atmosphere, those genes would never be expressed. And that's why E. coli could not use citrate. Well, what happened then was an error in DNA replication. The entire uh, set of genes controlled by that promoter was accidentally duplicated and basically inserted into the genome right next to it. However, when that happened, it was inserted next to a new, another promoter that was not inhibited by oxygen. So all of a sudden, this genetic rearrangement enabled the bacterium to produce the citrate transport protein. All of a sudden, it gained the ability to grow uh, in the presence of citrate. That gave it a new capability. So far from being destructive, here was a mutation that enhanced the ability of this bacterium to grow under this food source. So this was, if you're a bacterium, an entirely beneficial mutation that gave you a new capability. And if you wanted to get really persnickety about it, you could say it created a new species. And the reason you can say that is part of the species definition of E. coli to microbiologists is that it can't grow on citrate. Lo and behold, these bacteria can. So in a sense, uh, you've got a new, uh, new species of E. coli. So changes to allele frequency is not a mechanism for evolution. It's a mechanism for genomic entropy, which causes a loss of geno genetic uh, heterozygosity for healthy alleles, while making mutant alleles more common in large populations, thereby causing disease-promoting genes to become increasingly common in that population. That's not a mechanism for evolution either. That that's a mechanism for extinction over time. So, so according to the creationist critique of genetic changes, um, we're all going downhill. Um, the only thing that happens uh, with natural selection is uh, uh, we lose capabilities, genes go extinct, we become more and more degenerate, and basically we're all on a road to extinction. Well, that's absolute nonsense. If you look at the history of the Earth, even the five great extinctions, which are recognized by paleontology, by paleontologists, what that history shows is the adaptability of life and that adaptability to come back, to re-diversify, to inhabit new environments. That comes from the mechanism of evolution. So life adapts over and over again and the mechanism of that adaptation, the way in which living organisms show up in new environments, repopulate areas that have been devastated, by environmental catastrophes, adapt to environmental change. That is the mechanism of evolution itself that's at the heart of these. Um, the creationist view of life itself is profoundly depressing. 
And what I mean by profoundly depressing, it basically says we started out with a high degree of order. We've been going downhill ever since then. And the long-term future for life on this planet is that we're screwed. Um, the history of life doesn't show that at all. Uh, uh, evolution, in a sense, is a science that leads us to be optimistic, not necessarily about our own future as a species, but to be optimistic about the future of life itself on this planet. See, now if you doubt what I have on the screen here, I'll be happy to show you sources from secular mainstream science sources. That what I've said about these changes to allele frequency is not some creationist invented junk. This is from their camp. This is published by them. They acknowledge changes to allele frequency causes increased heterozygosity for members of a population or losing features for others and results in genes being permanently turned off to a population. That's how you get a chihuahua from a, from a dog by turning off genes, turn off the genes that make it big so it's small, turn off the genes that give it a long tail so it has a short one, turn off the genes that make lots of hair so it has very little, turn off the genes that make a long muzzle so it has a short one. That's how you get a chihuahua, by turning genes off. And now that's what's happening in all living things in this world slowly, is that genes are being turned off and organisms are becoming more like themselves they're not gaining structural designs, which evolution requires. They're simply gain, having the same, or they're losing features, but they aren't gaining anything. So what's the conclusion? Changes to allele frequencies in populations is not a mechanism for evolution either. It causes a loss of genetic information. That's the opposite of evolution. Living creatures harvest information from the environment around them. Now, now, here's what I mean by that. The mechanisms of genetic change and mutation, um, which are really quite varied, uh, enable organisms, in a sense, to try out uh, one combination of genetic information after another. Because these changes are unpredictable, uh, most of these changes either produce nothing or they are deleterious to the organism that possessed them. But by basically by input of energy, by reproducing, living organisms get to try one possible combination of information after another. When they finally find one that works, what that does is to give them an advantage in a particular environment over another organism or in a particular situation. So the information, in a sense, comes from the interactions of living organisms with the environment by the mechanisms of genetic change and natural selection. And that's where new biological information comes from. So there are, in conclusion, there are no mechanisms for evolution. The, me the alleged mechanisms of evolution, random genetic mutation acted upon by natural selection has been proven for 90 years to be no such thing. It's a mechanism for extinction. It causes deformities, weakness, death, and stillbirth. That's all it does. It doesn't design anything. There's zero scientific evidence for that. It would have to be the designer of all the fantastical structures in all the living things of the world if it were. Thank you. Uh, so the fossil record doesn't show us any evidence that evolution ever happened. Dozens and dozens of the world's most prominent scientists, some of them paleontologists and geneticists, have written in their own books. The fossil record does not show the clear evidence of evolutionary transition. You have to imagine it with your mind. Now, uh, about that, uh, the, that's exactly what to expect if there was a flood or if creation is true, that creatures don't change. So that's not a mechanism. Changes to allele frequencies in populations, not a mechanism of evolution. Genetic similarities has been destroyed by countless incongruencies in genetics between one kind of life and another. All, I haven't even talked about the evidence for creation, which is empirical and overwhelming. Maybe I'll do that when we have our talk. The scientific evidence is simply clear. Evolution is scientifically invalid idea and creation is confirmed by modern science. The, 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 the last thing I would say is it's difficult to think of any cohesive theory in science that has been subject to more assaults, more criticisms, and more attempts flatly to disprove it than Darwin's theory of evolution. 
And what has happened in the 160, 170 years since Darwin first published that idea is that our understanding of the mechanism of evolution has gained depth and breadth with our understanding of the new sciences of biochemistry, of genetics, molecular biology, and genomics. And every one of these threads of evidence have supported the broad outlines of Darwin's theory of evolution. And if you'd like a layperson commenting on that, a non-scientific person, uh, I, would I would take Pope John Paul II, who in a 1996 letter to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences pointed out that there are so many different lines of evidence from different scientific fields that have converged on the evidence for evolution that the fact that there are evolutionary mechanisms understood in terms of biochemistry, population genetics, genetics and molecular biology is in and of itself a significant argument in favor of the theory. And that comes from a person no less than the head of the Roman Catholic Church. And I think that's a pretty good argument that the scientific evidence for evolution is profound, it's pervasive, and it is compelling. The way genetic mechanisms of evolution have been proven to work over and over again with many different types of analysis and experiments is that new genes can be created by mutation and sometimes they're beneficial and will be selected for, will become uh, more prolific in the population and these will increase functional complexity. Analysis of comparative genomics confirms this and the evidence that we see of those changes occurring in the fossil record. That's how it really is.